Good morning. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our uh, Sabbath School uh, class presentation for uh, uh, series number nine, uh, May 27, 2023, entitled A City Called Confusion. And so, so far, we have uh, been discussing uh, partially the book of Revelation, focusing on uh, uh, the end times. And uh, today, we are going to deal with the uh, idea in which uh, we're going to deal uh, with the subject of uh, Confucians or Babylon. And so, uh, let me uh, uh, begin with a prayer. Uh, dear Lord, today, uh, we come to you. Uh, thank you for the blessing of uh, this lesson that we are going to present. And as we begin, Lord, <coughs> may it be that you give us an understanding and also uh, a very smooth presentation that we are going to have technically and also for the blessing of uh, our explanations uh, inspiring from the Holy Spirit. Uh, thank you for giving us that wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A city called Confusion. And uh, serious architects, uh, Revelation 17, 14. Uh, so today we are going to talk, uh, deal with, uh, focus our discussion on chapter 17 of the book of Revelation. And this will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For, the Lord, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Revelation 17, 14. So the founders uh, of the United States clearly understood that if a church draws its authority and power from the state, intolerance and persecution often follow for those who do not conform to the church mandates. And these early American leaders were well acquainted with the tyranny of uh, church state union in Europe. Uh, one of the reasons people left the old world for the new world was religious intolerance. Therefore, the founders wrote these memorable words into the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Congress, and I quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting a free exercise thereof. So that is our discussion today. Uh, we're going to deal with uh, uh, the, the, the church and state uh, 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 relationship uh, in, in throughout the details of our subject. However, there are two women in the visions around the conflict between Christ and Satan. And a woman clothed in white and standing who is persecuted by Satan in Revelation 12. And then a woman clothed in scarlet and seated on a, and is supported by Satan in Revelation 17 uh, and 18. And then the message of the second angel re refers to the second woman, Babylon, confusion is fallen, is fallen. Revelation 14.8. And so uh, uh, there are two opposite systems in our discussion today. Two types of wine and then two, two ways of thinking. Uh, two different leaders and then two ways of worshiping. So these are the outlines that we are going to deal with today. And so uh, here is our Sunday's lesson. I mean, two opposite system. And another angel followed saying Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, Revelation 48. The second angel's message is only one verse along Revelation, uh, one verse long in Revelation 48, but it is then developed and expanded further in uh, chapters 17 and 18. And Sunday's lesson compares God's faithful people from the image in chapter 12 with the apostate religious system in chapter 17. So, uh, two opposite system reveals with uh, two opposite uh, thinking uh, and another angel, see, Babylon is fallen. So, the Roman emperor uh, Trajan visited Babylon in 116 AD, soon after John wrote Revelation. The, uh, he found only ruins. 
Therefore, John was uh, think, talking about the literal city of Babylon in his writings. And so, according to Genesis, and we are going, in order for us to really understand uh, uh, the, 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 the statement, uh, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, we need to go back into the Old Testament background and its context in order for us to appreciate what really means Babylon is fallen. And because according to Genesis 11:9, Babylon means confusion. In the end time, a religious system mixed truth and lies, thus causing confusions. On the other hand, pure woman is a symbol of religious system based on the truth. In the end time, the world will follow Babylon and will harass the faithful remnant, but Babylon will fall. So uh, in this idea here, uh, in our Monday's lesson, we are going to deal with uh, two texts. Uh, Monday, the wine of the wrath, uh, read Revelation 17, 1 and 2, and 15, and Revelation 18, 1 to 4. How extensive is Babylon's influence? Monday's lesson discusses the wine of the wrath of God from Revelation 17 and 18. What causes such a strong reaction in God's part? So let's read it, uh, Revelation 17, 1 to 4 and 15. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornications, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of, the, full of names of blaspheming, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornications. And in verse 15, then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sets are people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So the question, how extensive is Babylon's influence? It's very extensive. It's throughout the world. It says, sir, the waters that you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So in, in essence, really, every tribe and people... <laughs> And so in, in, in Revelation 18, 1 to 4, again, after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, and has become dwelling place of demons, a prison of every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth had committed fornications with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share her sins and lest you receive her plagues. So, in essence, really here we can see that the... the, the, the extensive influence and then uh, what causes such a strong reaction of God's part? He said, come out. He said to his people, come out of her. You know, Revelation predicts, Revelation 17 predicts that there will be religious intolerance and deception in the future. <coughs> That's auspices of spiritual Babylon in verse 2 outlines the dramatic event uh, the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornications. And in v verse 2 continues its explanation of the mystery of Babylon the Great by declaring that she has committed fornications with the kings of the earth. What is fornication? It is an illicit union. It is the fallen church system uniting with the state. In, in the true church system, the church is united with Jesus Christ. The fallen church looks to the political leaders 
of the earth for power and authority. It seeks the state to enforce its decrees rather than drawing his strength from Jesus as a true head. She looks at the state for support. The fallen church described in Revelation chapter 17, 3 and 4 as a woman dressed in purple scarlet sitting upon the scarlet colored beast influences the state to support her falsehood. In verses 3 to 6, she passes around the cup of her erroneous doctrine. The world becomes intoxicated with these false religious ideas. Millions drink the wine of Babylon, drink the wine of Babylon, and are deceived. In the Bible prophecy, a woman represents the church in Jeremiah 6.2, Ephesians 5.25, a wife is likened to the church of the bride of Christ. The woman in scarlet and in purple in Revelation 17 is contrasted with a woman in white, the true believe, followers of God in Revelation 12, verse 1. The harlot in Revelation 17 represents a full system of religion. Remember that in the Bible, a beast represents a king or kingdom. Politicians eager to retain their positions will yield to the influence of majority who have drunk the wine of Babylon's false doctrine. The apostate church decrees will eventually be supported and enforced by the state. She derives power from the state but also influences the state. What a powerful symbol of illicit union between church and state. The Bible has, to, has prepared us to understand the symbolic terms the beast and its image have already been mentioned as representing God's enemies and the great controversy and marked as the badge of loyalty to Satan's side, Revelation 13. The fire that lasts forever has already been compared to the burning of the field of stubble in Malachi 4.1. It is like the eternal fire that totally consumed Sodom and Gomorrah many centuries ago. Unless the first time of the warning should lead us to doubt the gracious purpose of God who sends the first and second angels with a message that prepare us for the third. So the first angel's message reminds us of the everlasting truth. He calls all men everywhere to make up their minds about God. Uh, do we find the weight of evidence a sufficient basis for our faith? Can we trust and worship the one who created the whole vast universe? And the second angel reminds us of the falsity and deception of God's enemies. Every system based on Satan's lies is falling in corruption and defeat. Then the third angel warns us of the consequence. It is not God's will that any should perish. Nothing is plainer in all the scriptures. But if we prepare Satan's lies to the truth, if we persist in rejecting God's every effort to save and heal, there is nothing else he can do but sadly give us up and hand us over to an awful consequence of our own rebellious choice. This is what it means to experience God's wrath and mix with mercy at the end. And all we are not <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and if we are not healed and ready to live in the presence again, the life-giving glory of him who is love will consume all that is out of harmony when he comes. So he has to give us up. So the wine of wrath in our discussion today is that. So for all nations have drunk of the whole uh, wine of the wrath of her fornications. The king of the earth are committed fornications with her and the merchants have been, you know, become threats through abundance of her luxury. Babylon has fornicated with kings and merchants. The church has abandoned her true husband, Jesus, and has illicitly joined with civil powers. And then uh, she has adulterated the pure wine of the gospel and has given the wine of her own thoughts into the nations. She no longer follows Christ in order to get the support of the state. However, a pure church has remained faithful to her husband. She only serves a pure wine, the precious blood of Jesus Christ that washes away uh, sin, Matthew 26, 
28. So God calls his children in Babylon to come out of it. In Revelation 18, 3 to 4. So uh, this idea of uh, the wine of the wrath is that uh, it is just God giving us up in, because of our persistent rebellion. In our choose this lesson, mystery, Babylon the Great. Uh, just this lesson looks farther into Revelation 17 to unveil the nature of Babylon and the subsequent call to commitment to God in light of the prevailing apostasy. And let's read it in Revelation 14. Uh, uh, we're going to read Revelation 14, uh, I mean 17, 4 to 6. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup of full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornications. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Wow. So uh, now, uh, what name is on her forehead? It says here in Revelation 17.5, the mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. The fallen system of religion outlined in Revelation 17 is called Mystery Babylon the Great. A review of the teachings of ancient spiritual uh, Babylon will help us understand the falsehood and errors that Satan has introduced into the church, Christian church, I mean. In ancient Babylon, the world was commanded to bow in worship to a god of gold. Remember that in the story of Daniel chapter 3. Obedience to the commands of pagan religion was enforced through death decree. A conflict over worship occurred when Daniel and his friends were captives in Babylon. A counterfeit image was established in the plain of Dora. King Nebuchadnezzar commanded all his subjects to bow down and worship the golden idol. A decree was passed condemning to death anyone who did not bow down and worship the golden image. The union of church and state in Babylon in the 6th century BC and its propagation of religious falsehood that influenced all areas of life reveal how the devil will deceive multitudes in the future. Now, if we can solve the mystery of Babylon the Great, we will understand the crucial significance of symbolism of Revelation 17. And what does the Bible mean when it says mystery, Babylon the Great? As we have already noted, by the first century AD, literal Babylon, mighty empire that had dominated the Middle East, had already been destroyed. Babylon never rose to prominence again. Our passage cannot possibly be talking about literal Babylon, which has been destroyed more than 500 years before the time John wrote the book of Revelation. And so the Revelation 17 is talking about spiritual Babylon, an apostate religious system that would depart from pure teachings of God's word and reintroduce many of the teachings of the Old Testament Babylon to Christianity. <coughs> A group of men and women rebelled against God shortly after the flood. Remember, we go back to the flood again. In, 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 in Genesis, uh, chapter 11, it says that uh, uh, doubting his word, God has promised that would never again be a worldwide flood. Disbelieving his word, they built a tower to reach into the heavens to protect themselves in the eventuality of another global catastrophe. And the central issue was whether God can be trusted. Does he mean what he says? Because, you know, uh, when, when God told Noah to, that there will be flood, he did not believe it. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> After the flood, when God told, uh, you know, uh, the people that, that there will be no more flood, they did not believe him also. So uh, there is, uh, you know, the unbelief. But in, in, let's, let's go on here and read more text. 
because very important uh, to get the context. When the call to Babylon has fallen, has fallen, was given the first time, it was good news. What? Good news? Isaiah 29.9, Jeremiah 51.6-8. How was this call the eternal gospel in its antitypical meaning of Revelation 14 in John's day? And how can it be good news in our context in the end time world? Remember, it is a message given by three angels, messengers. And it says, Isaiah 21.9, And look, there comes a chariot of men with a pair of horsemen. Then he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And all the carved images of her gods he has broken to the ground. What is good news in there? Babylon has fallen. Uh, the, it was conquered by the Medo-Persia. And uh, I mean, Medo-Persia now was used by God to return uh, to Israel and, and, and Judah. Uh, so therefore, there is good news in, in, in this context because of the fall of Babylon. In Jeremiah 51, 6 to 8, flee from the midst of Babylon and everyone save his life. Do not be cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Babylon was a golden cup on the Lord's hand that made the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, therefore the nations are deranged. Babylon was sudden, has suddenly fallen and been destroyed. Wail for her. Take bump for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. And that is the prophecy of uh, Jeremiah during the captivity of the Jewish people when Nebuchadnezzar gathered them slaves into the Babylon. So the fall of Babylon was good news uh, to the Israelites then. So what is, uh, let's go back here. Let's go back again to Genesis chapter 11, 1 to 9. Uh, because uh, we need to get the, really the, the whole context of the story of Babel. Uh, now the whole earth had one language, one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from east to west, uh, uh, from the east. Remember uh, the journey to the east, from the east, and they found plain in the land of Shinar. They dwelt there, and they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and, and bake them thoroughly. And I remember that statement, come, let us. So there is that story of creation element in this story also. And they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose tops uh, is in the heaven. Let us make the name for ourselves. Lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower with the sun Man had built, and the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have all one languages. Language, I mean. And this is what they began to do. Now, nothing can be, can be proposed to do will be withheld from them. Let us come, let us go down and confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So, in, if you notice, the Lord did not destroy the building, the, the tower. Because the tower was not the issue. It was the people. So, when they built Babel, why is it because they didn't believe in God? Was it because they didn't believe that he had the power to destroy or was it because they did believe that God and they did believe that he had the power to destroy? Now they don't think he could be trusted when he said, I'll never drown you again. They didn't believe that. That's why they built the tower. Isn't that what it says? You see, they really believe in God, his existence and his power. That's why to believe that doesn't mean to say that you are on, his side, on God's side. The devils believed too. And in fact, they had such confidence that God could destroy them. They built the tower as, as, as tall as they did. You see, the exercise of power and force may only make rebels worse, but it might be for a moment gain the attention of those who are sinners indeed 
but would love to hear what you would have to say if they had everybody else would be quiet. And God wins people every once in a while during those quiet moments. But the devil must mock him for failure to be able to clear up the problems of this earth by the exercise of power. You know, when, when God said, I'm going to uh, send a flood in order to, you know, minimize the problem of sin, but the problem of sin was never resolved by the flood. Was never resolved by the power of the flood. But the great controversy is not over who has the power, is it? It's because who is telling the truth. God has been accused of the abused power of divine, divine power. And I'm sure Satan accused him of abusing his power in the time of the flood. You see what he'll do? Obey him or he'll drown you. The inhabitants of Babylon believe that God or hell drown you. Well, they didn't want to obey him, so they built a tall tower so they could escape the next flood when it come. When God says, I'm not going to drown you again. The Tower of Babel was built in direct defiance of the word of God. The Babel builders substituted human ideas and man-made theories for the instructions from heaven. When they said, God said, scatter. But they said, no, we are going to stay together. And so they were building this monument for their own glory. God confused their languages. The Genesis account put it this way. Therefore, it is the name called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad, opens the first of the earth. Throughout the scripture, Babylon represents oppressor of God's people. Babylon is the citadel of error. The center of apostasy it stands for rebellion against God and disobedience to the divine commands. God's judgment in the Old Testament, Babylon represents his final judgment upon the world. For an end time people, the story of Babylon falls is instructive. You will recall the Babylon attack uh, Jerusalem and forced many leading young men into captivity, including Daniel. Cyrus, the king of the east, eventually attacked Babylon and freed the Jewish captives and allowed them to return to Jerusalem and worship the true God. Once again, at the time of the end, God's people will be afflicted and persecuted by religious oppressor called Babylon the Great in Revelation 17.5. And the book of Revelation predicts that at the time of social chaos, political crisis, to triumph over the oppressive powers of the world and liberate his people, he will reign eternally. He will establish his throne securely in the universe forever. In the battle for uh, the throne, he will be a victor. His people will journey with him through limitless space to worship in the new Jerusalem. So, what it means is that uh, when we try to reach heaven by our own effort and self-sufficiency or build our identity on our own achievements and self-preservation, we follow the footsteps of Babylon. And that is really the story in the context of the Old Testament, Babylon. So, this. It has some spiritual connotations in our time today. So there are two ways of thinking here. In essence, uh, it says in Revelation 17.5, and on her forehead, name was written, Mystery the Great. So the original Babylon was found after an open rebellion against God, like the figurative Babylon. And then the figurative Babylon and her daughters changed the word of God for human thoughts and traditions. There are two types of religion. The one that follows God's word and trusts Jesus, his grace, his sacrifice, and his salvation. And the one who follows its own philosophies and trusts human authorities, leaders, and traditions. So Babylon has always tried to destroy those who kept the pure faith in Revelation 7 and 6. So in 
in Wednesday's lesson, Wednesday's lesson, a call to commitment. What promise did Jesus gave his disciples regarding his church? We are going to compare Matthew 16, 18 and Revelation 17, 14. He, and Matthew 16, 18, and I see, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail. In Revelation 17, 14, this will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. So, uh, in, in Jesus uh, has given authority to his church, but all institutions have a tendency towards self-preservation. What does it mean to come out of a broken system or institution in Revelation 18.4? The church does not exist for its own sake, but to create a worshiping and serving community of connected people in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. So two different leaders, it says, uh, she carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So Babylon, in essence, is seated in many waters, and her founders is a scarlet beast based on human system. So her leader is also a person or a human institution. And so, uh, however, the pure church is founded on the rock, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Her leader is Jesus. So in the last days of our history, a church-state system will arise again. The spiritual Babylon it will have a spiritual leader that will claim to speak in God's name and will try to take his place. So, uh, in Thursday's lesson, here we can see that uh, Babylon, the center of idolatry. Uh, we're going to read uh, Jeremiah 50, 33 to 38, and Jeremiah 51, 17, and 47. What do you discover in these verses about ancient Babylon's worship? of images and God's response to it. Since Jeremiah says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the children of Israel were oppressed along with the children of Judah. All who took them captive have been held them fast. They have refused to let them go and the Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He will thoroughly plead uh, their case that they may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. A sword is against the Chaldeans, says the Lord, against the inhabitants of Babylon, and against her princes and her wise men. A sword is against the soothsayers, and they will be fools. A sword is against her mighty men, and they will be dismayed. A sword is against their horses, against their chariots, and against their mixed peoples who are in their midst. And they will become like a woman. A sword is against her treasure, and they will be robbed. A drought is against her waters, and they will be dried up. For it is the land of carved images, and they are insane with their idols. If you notice this, they are for they are for it is a land of carved images, idols. They are insane with their idol, for they are insane with their idols. So Babylon really is a representation of idolatry, uh, carved images, idols, and stuff like that, and uh, sun worship. And here, one more uh, background or text that will allow us to appreciate uh, what, what it means. A center of idolatry. In Jeremiah 51, 17 and 47, Everyone is dull-hearted without knowledge. Everyone is metal smith. Every, I mean, every metal smith is put to shame by the carved images. For his molded image is falsehood and there is no breath in them. Those images are dead. No breath in them. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, 
that I will bring judgment into the carved images of Babylon. Their whole land shall be ashamed, and the whole slain shall be in the midst. So Babylon was the center of image worship. <coughs> Christ invites us to come directly to him. Images limit the ability of the Holy Spirit to impress upon our minds the things of eternity. Images are often accorded to sacredness and homage that belongs to God alone. We do not need to come to Jesus through the image of a saint. Jesus is our Lord Intercessor, our great high priest. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Further, Babylon is also encompasses of all apostate religious powers that have drifted from the clear teachings of God's words. So two ways of worshiping here in our discussion today. A drought is against her waters and they will be dried up for it is the land of carved images and they are insane of their idols. So idolatry was one of the causes of Babylon's fall. Worshipping images was also introduced early in church history, uh, moving Christians away from true worship. And however, uh, a pure uh, church obeys all God's commandments, including the second one, which prohibits creating and worshiping images. So when people worship images, they are reducing God's image, majesty to a lifeless statue. They degrade themselves by making themselves similar to the objects they worship. So Babylon, the center of idolatry, is that if we ridicule here, again, if we ridicule or persecute those who have different opinions or use power to uphold our understanding of truth, we follow the footsteps of Babylon, then we are also guilty of worshiping a false image of God. So that is uh, in spiritual sense. So the pure, uh, both pure church and Babylon claim that they serve God and believe in Jesus Christ. How can we tell them apart? And so this is going to be our uh, uh, second to the last slide, and we are going to summarize. The pure church, clothed in the sun, decorated with the righteousness of Christ. The Babylon, clothed in a purple scarlet, decorated with human falsehood and tradition. And then decorated in the pure church, decorated with garland of stars based on Christ and the teachings of the apostles. In Babylon, decorated with gold, gems, and pearls, she trusts her own power and is based on human reasoning. In the pure church, standing on the moon, she gets her power from God's word. The Babylon, sitting on a scarlet beast, she gets her power from political powers of the earth, which is the state. And so in, in Jesus and his word are only safeguard in the crisis to come. The forgeries will also uh, will, will be so close to the truth that they will, they will only be able to discern them by filling our minds with the word of God daily and living in communion with Jesus. So, uh, uh, to summarize, to, to end our discussion today, here is my last slide here. The fallen denominational churches are Babylon. Babylon has been fostering poisonous doctrines wine of error. This wine of error is made up of false doctrines such as the natural immortality of the soul, the eternal torment of the wicked. This kind of kindred errors are presented to the world by various churches. And we are going to discuss more of this next, next week in our discussion about, uh, you know, the doctrines. And then, notwithstanding the spiritual darkness and alienation, from God that exists in the churches which constitute Babylon, the great body of Christ's true followers are still to be found in their communion. Uh, Ellen G. White in last day's events, chapter 14, page 198. So that is our presentation uh, this morning. And it be that as we think about this 
ideas and uh, the the uh, confusions that uh, uh, involve many many doctrines and uh, falsehood. We may it be that we will be protected by these confusions when we study the Word of God. And so, therefore, may it be that as we think it through on these discussions and presentations, that you will be magnif- God will be magnified in our own lives, that we do not rely on ourselves, uh, we do not rely on our accomplishments, uh, we do not rely on, you know, our abilities to do, because it is all about God. In, in this context, Babylon is about self, it's about me. And so, you know, sometimes uh, we have a temptation to do that. And yet, uh, may God help us in our discussion today and our presentation in our understanding. Let's pray. The Lord today, thank you again for this blessing of this lesson. As we think it through about this subject, help us, Lord, uh, to understand and appreciate that uh, you have presented this lesson in order for us to be prepared for the end time crisis and help us Lord to be always be clinging into unfaithful to you because you are the truth the life in Jesus name we pray amen